Okay, so this is the highbrow part of the uh, episode. I'm joined by Jennifer Dazzle uh, from the Art Curious podcast to answer all your art history questions. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, John. Thank you again for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, yeah, we've had quite a few questions. So let's um, let's just jump in. I'm ready. Uh, this one is from Benjamin Lester on Patreon. Thanks for the tea, Benjamin. And he says, John, love your hair. Thanks, Benjamin. I love it too. Very fond of it. I'm very attached to it. Um, I'd like to ask your guest about the research aspect of her podcast. How much time does she need to research her topics? And has she ever discovered something that changed her opinion of a particular artist? I was thinking about this question and the first part about how much time it takes, it actually is a little bit difficult for me to estimate per episode, because usually what I do in terms of my workflow is that I am working on multiple episodes all at once. So I'm usually in the middle of researching one while I'm completely writing on another, recording a third, and then releasing or promoting a fourth. So it's all mixed up at this point. But I'd say it probably takes a good five to 10 hours to research every episode individually, if I had to guess. And when it comes to my opinions changing, I'm not sure it's something that I've discovered along the way of doing the podcast, but it happened a lot more when I was first being introduced to art history. So I, in my book, I talk about this very early on. I was someone who was not interested in the Impressionists as artists when I was growing up. I thought they were a little too pretty, a little... Oh gosh, I associated it with my mom because my mother has a poster that was on their bedroom wall for the longest time. And so I just thought of them being very decorative and that there was nothing really lurking beneath the surface. It wasn't until far, far later, decades later, when I started studying art history seriously, learning about the fact that the Impressionists were kind of the black sheep of the art world during their time and that they were very anti-establishment and that their work was very hated when they first were released. And so it's funny because now we think of them as so commonly accepted, you know, they're on every umbrella and every tote bag within any museum. Uh, but to know that they first started out being what I like to call really true badasses, that really changed Yeah. Me. Yeah, because I used to not like them at all. And now I have so much more respect and so much more interest for their works of art. So that was a huge change for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they were like, the punk rock of their day. Absolutely. <laughs> Completely. And I think that a lot of people forget about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Julian Davis, longtime supporter of the podcast uh, on Patreon and former podcast guest, says, if you could curate a show of five 20th century artists you would consider tragically overlooked by art history, who would you pick? Oh, this was another really hard one. This required me to sit down and think for a while and do a bunch of Googling. I keep lists of a bunch of artists whom I've used in exhibitions in the past, people who I'm interested in maybe doing work on in the future. So I was scrolling through a lot of that. And I decided that what I wanted to do is I could put together an ideal exhibition that's especially of women, because I love to focus on women as artists. And then I thought, of course, it would probably also be a lot of women of color too. So I think there are a lot of artists who are on my list who I think are very interesting, but by no means are, you know, overlooked by art history. I think they've been received more yeah. and more, you know, um, attention recently, but they're of course not huge names. So the first couple are actually Cuban artists from the modernist period who are from Cuba. The first is Zilia Sanchez. And the second is Carmen Herrera. They're both painters, but especially in the case of Vilia Sanchez, her works are both painterly and sculptural at the same time. So they mix that, those boundaries together. And I think um, Carmen Herrera actually only died in the past year or so. So she lived to be about, what, 105, 106 years old. So she had a very, very long career. And uh, she was somebody who lived not only in Cuba, but also in New York and Paris and had an extremely long career as someone who was kind of mid-century um, and one of the really formative artists in Cuba at the time. One of my other favorite artists is, again, someone who I feel like has been on 
The Rise recently, which is an Indian artist named Amrita Sher Gill. And she was an Indian Hungarian painter. She was actually born in Budapest, but then she spent most of her time in New Delhi, especially. And she traveled all out throughout her life, but she was really famous at the very beginning part of the 20th century as a modernist painter in India. Very famous during her lifetime and very well respected during her lifetime. And I think that's sometimes seen as a little bit rare because Indian society is usually seen as a little more conservative when it comes to women, especially women in the art world. So she is a fascinating right. person. So I recommend people checking her out if they're interested. Running along, the other one is someone who's relatively new to me in that I've heard her name, but that I actually haven't until in the past years, maybe, been learning about her. And that's Tarsila do Amaral, who was a Bra Brazilian painter, uh, but also a draftswoman. And she also worked as a translator, which is really interesting. So she was uh, another modernist artist working in Brazil and South America, whose works, I think, have been very well received. She's considered, I think, kind of the equivalent of Frida Kahlo is in Mexico. She's considered the Frida of Brazil. But again, she Okay. She's new, newer to me, even though she's been around. I think she died in the 70s. And then another artist I love is Alma Thomas, who is a Black artist from here in America. And her work um, really has been taking off in the last few years as being really popular for a lot of purchases and exhibitions in the museum world. Her work is almost very abstract, but it almost looks like a mosaic. It's these bright, beautiful colors that have been arranged in these mosaic designs. And they're really stunning. They're gorgeous. She worked really big in some cases. So they really strike you when you're walking through a museum exhibition. I love her pieces. It was very, very scattered in terms of style for a lot of these artists, but they're definitely all deserving of, of a second look. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Uh, Kevin Seymour on Instagram says, how do we get working class males excited about art history as a subject and break away from the idea that this is the domain of upper class students, particularly women. At least take a class in the subject. I think there is also an unfortunate idea that heterosexual males are putting their masculinity at risk by opening an art history book. Any insights? <sighs> there you go. Nice simple I know, question. I like, have to sigh really loudly because this one, it hurts my heart to read it, but it's because I understand it so well. I've heard variations on this question for years. And it's true because there is such a stigma in many cases to a lot of the humanities. But I think art history in particular gets extra stigmatized because some people think of it as useless or something that's not very serious or meaningful, something that's a trifle. And I definitely don't agree with that, but that's definitely a, an opinion that people it's also one that I think has a very, as, as the writer mentioned of the question, it has this very stigmatized sexist and classist element to it. Um, to be fair, I think that art is for everyone and there is art history that's for everyone. There's works of art that can appeal to certain people that don't appeal to others and vice versa. So I definitely have always felt like art has a place in anyone's lives. But to be fair, um, Though I believe that's true, I think art history, but also art museums, art institutions in particular, have made it really hard to open up the field widely because not everybody feels like they are comfortable in art institutions. And a lot of that has to do with accessibility and representation. Some people don't feel like they see themselves literally and figuratively reflected in museum collections. And I think that's changing slowly, but it is still an issue. It's still something that museums are working actively at. So I think that's the biggest thing is going to be exposure and accessibility and opening up that world. At least that's a place to start. Uh, I wish I knew more than that. That's really what I would go forward with. But actually doing that is is rough. So I wish I had more concrete steps. Having it be part of schools regardless is a big deal i think giving that exposure to children at a very early age in any form i think is helpful but of course we know at least in the u.s where i'm based that's always the first thing to be cut so um i think lobbying for more exposure to the arts in general music dance performance theater art of all kinds is something that we desperately need more of right um 
this was kind of news to me. I didn't even know that this was a thing. Um, so maybe you can explain it uh, if I got it right. So it's particularly it's art history. So it's like if it's contemporary art, that's OK. But it's like once it drifts into art history, then it becomes a challenge to my masculinity. Is that the way it works? That is what a lot of people think. Yes. It's like if you're looking at. I would say mid-century, 20th century art and beyond, then you got that macho sense of, of art. So thinking about people like Jackson Pollock, that's when art masculinity yeah. became so suffused. So if you're studying that period and after, it's like it's okay in some ways, but that prior to that, especially if you're looking at art that I think is considered decorative or um, historical. The pre-Raphaelites or something like exactly. that. Exactly. People think like, oh, that's just a little too... Wow. For me. Okay. It's a, a stereotype for sure that it's not necessarily founded in reality, but a lot of people do feel that way. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, I hadn't e never even thought about mm -hmm. it. Uh, Natalie Wiseman in Missouri says, why do you think people are still unwilling to accept, even with so much evidence, that ancient classical sculpture and architecture was brightly painted? and not the plain white marble we still see upheld as the original look. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for your insight. I wanted to say, yay, Natalie, my husband is from Missouri also, so we got a fun spark, uh, spot for Missouri in our family. Um, just like how I was talking about art history being seen as elitist or sexist or not masculine, I think that's a lot of a matter of exposure. I think it's a matter of exposure here as well. Because since we were kids, in many of our cases, we've been looking and taught that classical sculpture and architecture were these pristine, white, elegant structures. And we've seen them not only in movies, but books, cartoons. And it's really only been truly in the last few decades that I think this idea of polychrome, you know, multicolored sculptures and architecture has really been pushed to the forefront of public discussion. Um, I think that this is something that's been privately known in archaeological and art history worlds for a while, but has only really been started to be pushed further so that everyday people like, like me and you uh, ha are hearing about this. And so I think it's really just a matter of the fact that this is sort of a new idea to most of us. It's also what we can actually see with our eyes when we are at archaeological sites or at museums. You know, these works really have been stripped, basically through, yeah. uh, worn away with time of those original colors. And in some cases, you can't see very much at all unless you have a microscope or you're really up close to a piece, which isn't always possible in museum or uh, yeah, things. Yeah. So uh, it's really hard because our eyes are telling us one thing, even though we might know something else factually. So again, I think it's just a matter of exposure, but I think it's really cool the way that a lot of uh, museums now are doing re you know, recreations or representations or inviting artists to come in and recreate what a work of art might have looked in the time in which it was created. And so you'll see yeah. an actual vase, a Greek amphora, for example, and then they'll have an artist's rendition of what it would have looked like. And I think doing things like that is incredibly fascinating and also more important to get the word out, I suppose you could say, about that. Yeah. And that just helps with that further understanding and, and acceptance. Yeah. I reckon movies have helped perpetuate that as well, because if you see a, like a Roman movie or, you know, a, movie from the 50s or something like that it's all white statues it's, you know and i suppose until they do uh well actually just thinking about it if you think of when i think about egypt i kind of know they were painted because in movies that's the way they've been re recently you know like the mummy or anything like that it's, it's they will have the um the, the hieroglyphics will be in color yes. you know how far does it go back do you think like do you think like stonehenge was painted or what's that new one they found gebekli tepe you know or were they painted or that's a great question i actually don't know i'm mostly thinking about things that are in as you mentioned the middle east and also north africa and mm. southern europe but that's a great question i'm really curious i don't know Mm -hmm. I seem to remember the back of my mind there. I think they reckon Gebekli Tepe was painted something, or but I'm not sure. Or similarly with the, 
the Aztec and the um, Mayan yeah. stuff. I wonder, was that painted as well? Yeah. It, I mean, it seems likely to me, uh, but I don't know specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. Um, Luke Travers on Instagram says, thanks for having Jennifer on your podcast. You're welcome, Luke. My question, um, when did narrative artists start to create their own characters and stories rather than refer to religious or mythological tales? And were there any artists who are particularly creative at concocting their own stories rather than using a known source? Okay, this was a really good question. And I have to say it stumped me a little bit because the thing that came to mind for me was the big transition that occurred in subject matter around the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance when artists started considering themselves as primary creators and considering their lives to be at the center of their works. Uh, so people like the German artist Albrecht Dürer, for example, uh, a lot of the people who were first creating the very first self-portraits in oils. So we were moving in Europe especially, this is very Eurocentric of me, but in art at that time, people were moving away from working within guilds. So you'd have a bunch of painters working together, okay. commissions for kings, queens, noblemen, and so forth and artists working more individually. And so they would be doing a lot more self-promotion of themselves as these incredible makers because they're jockeying for a lot of the same works and, and job offers. But still, I think a lot of those portraits and a lot of the portraits that even came later by people like Rembrandt or Artemisa Gentileschi, they were still creating portraits with a lot of symbolic or allegorical themes. So they're still reaching back to those original mythological or, or historical tropes. But when it comes to what an actual character might be, that's, I think, a little bit different. And that was much harder for me to come up with. The person who finally came to mind after thinking a while and kind of Googling around is William Hogarth. So I'm thinking specifically about some of the painting series that he, done, he did, like um, A Rake's Progress, The Harlot's Progress, and then Marriage à la Mode, Mariage à la Mode, it's probably his most famous series, in which he is taking one narrative that he has come up with, and over the course of six to eight to ten paintings, he's bringing you from the beginning of the story through its inevitable downfall. Um, and those, to the best of my knowledge, were narratives that he came up with himself. They weren't based on pre-existing literature or stories. They were narratives of his own devising. They're still highly allegorical because most of these have um, very gendered or classist beliefs about the way that people should behave in pre, I think it's pre-Victorian at that point. But as far as I'm aware, they are still characters that exist in these series of paintings that were Hogarth's devising entirely. I don't know if he was the first, but that's who comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's well, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking like it seemed like it was almost part of the uh, discipline, meaning, you know, there are certain rules to do with drawing, there are certain rules to do with paint, what, you, you know, fat over lean, th you know, really practical things like that. And back then, certainly in the Renaissance, uh, and you correct me now, of course, if I'm wrong, but it seemed like there were certain rules about composition, like there's this particular biblical story, there's this one, you know, and the whole uh, focus of the creativity was like how can I paint you know within that confine and and express myself in a different way it's like here's my take on this old story and here's my take on that old story you know um, and it didn't as you say like I, they were sort of stuck within that until as you say they got out started to Very much. invent invent their own yes absolutely I think a lot of that also is that you're trying to keep within it those imposed boundaries of what collectors would like, for example, or mm. in some cases, the subject matter would be dictated by a king who's commissioning a work of art. And so using those particular religious or historical or mythological scenes, they would fall in and out of fashion. So, you know, if you look in the thinking about like Dutch Baroque art, you're seeing a lot of biblical, early biblical stories like the death of Lucretia or Susanna and the bathers. So things that allowed for that religious aspect, but also a little sensuality on the side in the case of the female protagonists of those images. So 
it's all these various little things that are at play. And um, so, yeah, artists had only so much wiggle room within those confines to yeah. say. It, it's wild to think about like the, the hundreds of years before, uh, say, Hogarth and then how if like, let's just say he was the first and uh, how quickly it accelerated oh. from then on, you know. <laughs> it's fascinating it's fascinating well i mean especially in the last couple hundred years in particular the status of artist has raised so much it didn't have to have yeah. quite that same level of you know genius and genius is such a loaded and sometimes problematic term but it is true how much more that started being fed into the narrative of who an artist is and who gets to be an artist yeah um it's just exploded like you said yeah yeah David Zegert on Instagram says, I find Corbet fascinating. One could perceive him as an intense dude, both in life and in the subjects he painted. I'd love any insight on him and his work. And would you consider him as the first realist? <laughs> I love Corbet, I've got to say. Preaching to the choir. He is often alongside Edward Monet, or Manet, excuse me, um, considered to be often called, you know, the father of modern art. Um, and they are often known as realists because in the parlance of the 19th century in France in particular, the realists were those who were painting real life. So they were the scenes that you'd see of laborers, of commoners, of peasants and farmers working in these villages, people in ordinary surroundings. So not necessarily in elite atmospheres or, you know, in the center of Paris enjoying cafe culture that was starting at that time. It was really a knee-jerk response to what came before. So we're looking at those very um, self-important historical pieces that we've been talking about, or religious to mytho mythological subject matter, and also um, romantic art, which came beforehand. And I don't mean romance like love. I mean romance as in very kind of darkly suffused with emotion, very strong and dramatic works of art. And so Corbet was one of those artists who was really fighting against all of that on multiple sides, although he was also inspired by it too. So it, there's a little bit of a, um, what am I trying to say? There's a little bit of, a, of playing with the rules, I think, in his case. He did that a lot, in fact. And I think that's something that's really interesting about him is that he was a little bit of a, a troublemaker. He liked to stir the pot, as, as we say. Um, but he was also considered... I guess he would like to consider himself to have been an outsider because he was not from Paris. He was from a small town called Ornon. And even though his parents were actually very well off, he liked to think of himself as being an outsider to the art world. And so therefore he was a real man of the people. And so that gave him some credibility once this realist phase became en vogue, I suppose you could say. And it's also what made him somebody that a lot of later artists, like the Impressionists, idealized him because of it, even though it was a little bit of a put on. Um, in French, calling him intense, I think that's very true. Um, you know, he made numerous paintings. A lot of his most famous paintings were things that were considered rather scandalous during his time. And I think even depending on your point of view, some people think that they can be scandalous today. So I'm specifically thinking of his most infamous work, Origin of the World, which is on view at the Musée d'Orsay, and which is a very realistic, right in your face view of a woman's genitalia. And I did a whole episode of Art Curious on this painting because it's really interesting. But there's truly just so much to talk about with Courbet. He, that painting's still controversial. <laughs> it is still controversial. Every single time I go there, I still, to the Musée d'Orsay, I still see people kind of averting their eyes or stop doing a double take from across the room. Um, uh, Probably one of the most me memed uh, paintings, you know, as well. So much. And it's so funny because when I was working in an art museum a couple of years back, we would constantly, and I mean constantly, and I, I do live in the American South, so it is a more conservative area overall, but we would constantly receive calls and emails from people asking when we were going to put loincloths over our Greco-Roman sculptures. So I can only imagine, you know, I would hope that in France they're a little more lenient about nudity and things like that. But I can only imagine if we had a work like that here in North Carolina. Wow, it, yeah. 
not go on view. Could not go on view. Um, when you were saying that, uh, you know, himself and Manet were painting the, the common person kind of thing, had they got out of their studio yet? Were they, did they go and do the paintings outside or did that not happen until the Impressionists or, or had they already done that? I believe Corbet did. I think he was one of the ones who was making before A out. So he did a number of pieces that I actually really love that I don't think get as much attention, which is some really wonderful forest scenes, some beach scenes, incredible ocean landscapes, seascapes that he did. And I, I'm not totally sure, but I believe he did those on site. And then also, you know, and this is where my art history gets a little fuzzy, is the um, people like Corot, the uh, Barbizon painters also, they were outside of their studio in the forest surroundings as well. And then also, um, I think it's, oh goodness, Daubigny, I can't remember. There's another, a couple other painters that were bigger names coming up right as Monet and his cohort, I think, were in school. Yeah. So they were really the first guard to get outside of the studio. Yeah, I think, the, well, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think there was a transitionary kind of period where they'd go out and they'd sketch, they'd do ske lots of sketching, and then yes. they'd go back to their studio and make the painting of this idyllic country sort of side scene. But it was all made in the studio, including yes. sometimes getting in models and, you know, but uh, not doing the impressionist thing, you know, of the Van Gogh with the candles on the hat and all that sort of thing <laughs> out, out, right out in there, you know. Pretty not nice. yet. But what I love about that is that's not necessarily because um, of interest or, or not wanting to be able to create the work fully outside. It was really a technological advancement. It wasn't really until paints became more portable and inside tubes that yeah. that happened. And I love that. I love that it was actually um, an issue with materials. A lot of yeah, it. technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kevin Mann on Patreon, thanks for the tea, Kevin says, Hi, thanks for arranging this interesting podcast. You're welcome, Kevin. My question is, given the relatively recent publicity around the dangerous nature of some pigments, i.e. cadmium and lead-based oil paints, are there any stories or accounts of early painters becoming unwell given the unknown nature of these toxic elements? I think the, the key word here for me is early. So how early is early in, in the yeah uh, the question here but you know i think the most frequently that we've heard about this is really in the case of people like van gogh and goya and you know some people even extend back to people like michelangelo and caravaggio but we know in the case of van gogh that he liked to lick his paint brushes and that a lot of the paint that he was using was lead or, or at least contained lead so that's been something that doctors have diagnosed him as potentially being someone who was afflicted with all kinds of neurological issues and some poisoning, uh, potential poisonings that had occurred from there. Because, you know, talk about things like stomach pains uh, that he experienced and some delusions and I guess depressions have been linked to that kind of ingestation also. The other person yeah. who comes to mind is um, William Morris, although he looked to be in his 60s, I think early 60s, but the specific kind of green that he used in a lot of his wallpaper designs was a type of arsenic. Um, oh, right, yeah, wow. He was noted as having been sick for a while before his death, so it's never been really confirmed exactly what went on with him, but it does give you pause to wonder if maybe it had something to do with the materials that he and his studio was handling. But yeah, there's been a, yeah. a lot of different examples of this throughout time. Yeah, I, I, um, I think Beethoven, I, I was yeah. going to say, I think there was a lot of toxic stuff around because there's a, a book I read years ago about where they uh, analyzed a lock of his hair, yes. of Beethoven's hair, and he was riddled with lead poisoning as well. So I think like someone else was too, like Handel maybe. I, I read this too. Yeah. I think it's so interesting. Yeah, it's just around. And um. Yeah. So enough, Napoleon, I think, it's something having to do with the paint that was on his walls, uh, oh, okay. supposedly as well. So yeah. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I remember like lead uh, toys when I was a kid, you know, yeah. and 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 lead and actual lead and pencils. So, yes. you know, we think we think we're all toxic now, and we are, but 
it was pretty bad back then as well. <laughs> True. Good point. Uh, Evan Thomas Lilly on Patreon. Thanks for the tea. Uh, Evan says, hello. Thank you for being part of this podcast. Uh, that's to you, uh, Jennifer. My question is, which painter slash sculptor uh, before 1899 would most likely win the Great British Bake Off? <laughs> now, I, I hope you know what the Great British Bake Off is because I don't. Yes. Oh, yes. My my husband and I, we watch it all the time. I think we are almost caught up to the latest season that's on Netflix. What is it? It's just a, a baking show, is it? Yes, but it's delightful. It's um, it's redeeming of life in some ways, I think, when things get cake. So refreshing. <laughs> and are the are the are the are the uh, cakes they make are they really sculptural and like are they little works of art or or am I sometimes they can be and usually every week has a different theme. So one week will be bread, uh, this will be pies and tarts and you know um, viennoiserie things like that. But I love this one because it really made me think what are some of the key components to winning Bake Off? And I think you have to be able to be somebody who works really well under pressure um, to create okay. stunning, you know, beautifully, aesthetically lovely designs, but also stable designs because you don't want it to just collapse. Um, something that's appealing to the judges and, and so forth. And I had a particular person in mind who just popped into my, my brain while I was thinking about this. But then my question is, it's not a British artist. And so is that against the rules of Bake Off? If it's the great British Bake Off, if I pick someone who is not British, is that okay? Um, you're asking me, I didn't even know what this show was like five minutes ago. So uh, <laughs> you're on your own there, Jennifer. <laughs> well, I'll give you two examples then. Um, first person yeah. who popped into mind for me was Michelangelo because you worked I mean, not grouchy, so I guess he wouldn't win the congeniality aspect of the show. But um, as far as determination, focus, and being able to yeah. create... Both not great on deadlines, though. You know, that is a good point. That is a good point. Probably, he, cake could probably born in the oven. Ooh, <laughs> and he wouldn't be finished at the deadline. <laughs> it's the same thing with Leonardo. I feel like there's no possibility of Leonardo remotely making any... Oh, no. You'd have five... Brilliant drawings. Uh, one, uh, two, three of the cakes with the, the batter would be mixed, and the rest wouldn't be finished. <laughs> exactly. So I have to go with: Would it be somebody, you know, uh, somebody kind of stable? And depending on your point of view, maybe a little bit dull in comparison. So maybe it would be somebody like Reynolds or Gainsborough. Very, very um, bringing the commissions in on time, but very. Um, Straightforward, I suppose. I would probably want to have somebody be a little more dramatic. So I think I would lean more towards William Blake or Turner as something yeah. that visually. Oh, you can imagine me. imagine the cakes William Blake could turn out. Gosh. <laughs> I want someone to make those. I would love to see one of those. Yeah. But I don't there know. Be, there would be explosives and fireworks involved, I'm sure. Can they do that? <laughs> sure. Outside, maybe. <laughs> Is uh, Sergeant too late? Is he? Was he? He 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 would have been born pre. He would have been born pre eighteen ninety nine. But he would have been great for that sort of thing. Is no, that'd be right up his alley. That's a really good point. I think he would have been because he has that nice combination of flair, but also yeah. the ability to bring it in on time, as you said. Yeah, he looks like he always struck me as somebody who'd be very good at schmoozing, you know, like work in the room, talking to the right people, being very affable and friendly and getting the commissions and all that kind of thing. So I can yeah. imagine him in a, ba in a baking show very easily. I love that. OK, yes. Now I want somebody to make a spoof video of painters. And so <laughs> it, got, I think that would be really fun. I'd yeah, he wasn't the first one. The first one that popped into my mind was Rodan or Rodan. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Ooh. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, he would be really good too. He was yeah. good at commissions and working to deadlines and all that sort of thing, wasn't he? And still doing I something so. in interesting. Very interesting. Very unique and different. I think he would definitely have that innovation element down. Who else did that one? That's a good one. Well, I am so glad you knew what that show was because I looked at them and thought, well, I haven't. I hope Jennifer knows who this, what this show is about. It's a fun um, one. 
that's brilliant jennifer fantastic um wealth of knowledge as usual it's so interesting talking to you um jennifer's podcast is the art curious podcast if you're listening definitely i encourage you to check it out and she's got a brilliant course about women artists but well, you tell you tell them about your your, your course at the women artists sure it's called Breaking Barriers, Women Artists of Renaissance Europe. We focus mainly on Italy, England, and, oh, goodness, I think maybe a little bit of the, the Netherlands and France in there. And it's all from 29 days of women artists. So it's basically a mini episode of Art Curious every day for three weeks straight. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard a few of them, and they're brilliant, really good. Thank you. Okay, well, um, yeah, everyone seems very interested in, in this. Lo lots of great questions. So, uh, yeah, it was lovely, lovely having you on. And thanks for coming in. Thank you again. And your listeners have the best and most insightful questions. So thank you to everybody for writing in. These were really good questions. Oh, brilliant. I've never felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti. Actually, I'd prefer a cup of tea. A cup of tea would be lovely. So, yeah, just a little reminder, mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said, you know what, I've been listening to your podcast for ages, and I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great, I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton. Gently does it all one word or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron. I would really appreciate it if you could do that, particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it. It would be great. It would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you. Bye. We are the Argyle Pimps. The lies of drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimps. The lies of drink. Come on, lies of drink. Come on, lies of drink. We are the Argyle Pimps. The lies of drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimps.